Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here at SHOT Show 2024 today, joined once again by Mr. Mike Branton of Gideon Optics. Uh, Mike is a huge optics nerd with experience in a couple of different com uh, companies. You were with uh, Primary Arms for a while, you were with Swamp Pox for a while, and now you're doing your own new startup here. Yeah, I'm with Gideon Optics. Yeah, we've been in here, we did Pistol Dots last year, and then uh, this year we're expanding, and I've got a new LPBO here, so let's talk about LPBOs. Okay. So there's a lot of LPBOs out there. Yes, there are. And some of them are really cheap. And now there's one more. <laughs> and some of them are really expensive. Yes. And yeah. I look at this and I'm like, okay, I can look at magnification range and the weight. And those are like the only quantifiables I can think of. So do I spend a lot of money on a high-end one? Am I going to get features? Like what features can I get improved by throwing money at an LPBO? Right. Versus... What, you know, there's a whole bunch of lenses in there, and there's going to be some stuff that's just dictated by physics. Right. Where a 10000 well, not ten, two thousand $2,000. Sometimes 10 now. Okay. It's really? all, yeah. Ask, ask Sig with the new NSGW optic. Oh. There it is. I mean, it's got a laser piggyback thingy on top of it, but there, that's, that's, true. Like, that's 11 like, grand a pop. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, so, Uncle Sam. <laughs> so what is, what is there that, you know, Gideon can do just as well as Sig versus... Versus not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Lightness, right. So, that's, yeah, it's a, it's a simple question with, a, again, a complicated answer, right? And this is the part where uh, the internet guys expect me to pound my chest and go, just as good, just as good, right? But let's have a real conversation about it. Let's, yeah, I want to contribute to Forgotten Weapons uh, the, the best I can. Let's talk about what things, what things are really like and that. And so, the first thing is you cannot defeat math. Right. Math is math. And so this is a 1 to 10 with a 34 millimeter tube and a 28 millimeter objective lens. So it's a little bit big, it's a little bit heavy compared to a 30 millimeter tube optic with a 24 millimeter lens. So why did I do the big heavy one? What's the problem with 1 to 10s? They get tied at 10 power. I turn this thing from 1 to 10 and I can't see through it and I'm fighting it and it's a pain in the butt to look through. If I make my tube a little bit bigger, I make my internal lenses a little bit bigger, I make my objective lens a little bit bigger, and I'm smart with my optical design, it's a little bit easier to see through this one at 10 power than some of the other LPVOs on the market. And that's something that I can accomplish at our price level, which this is about a $400 LPVO. Um, and it's got great glass, it's a true 1X down low, it does all the things that I expect from an LPVO at that price point. And it's plenty tough, uh, you know, the aluminum is the aluminum. It's, uh, you know, it's got quality parts in it. It's gonna do uh, the toughness things that we expect. So why is it 400 bucks when a, when a, a primary arms one to eight platinum is 1500 bucks? And why is that scope 1500 bucks when a night force attacker is a thousand dollars more than that? Let's talk about it. Excellent question. Yeah, yes. there we go. So now I've circled down to your question. So uh, the, the primary arms optic is a Japanese-made optic. This is a Chinese-made optic. So the Japanese optics do have better glass. They are crisper. Uh, they get a little bit more light transmission, um, which doesn't matter until it does. If I'm shooting in broad daylight, uh, I'm shooting a match, and uh, you know, even if it's cloudy overhead, I'm getting like 98% light transmission through this optic. I'm fine. It doesn't matter. If I am on a hunt and I'm running an LPVO on like an elk hunt up north and I've spent a bunch of money for that tag and a bunch of money for the outfitter and I've taken my two weeks of vacation for the year to try to bag an elk and the elk trots out there and the sun has gone down and I don't have night vision on this thing, then I need as much light gathering as I can possibly get. And I'm going to want as close to 100% light gathering as I can get. If I've spent that much money on that elk hunt and I'm 15 grand into that elk hunt to begin with, go ahead and buy that primary arms with the Japanese glass and you'll get a little bit of a benefit. You might be able to see that elk, take that shot, get your trophy, whatever, right? So it's, it's one of those things where it doesn't matter until it does. Right. So the customer needs to decide how much performance am I willing to pay for in a realm of diminishing returns. Because I can go way past even $3,000, and there's valid reasons why a March scope will cost that much for the guys that are doing March scope stuff, you right. know. 
Um, they demand that performance level. It matters to them for what they're doing. You stick me behind the rifle. I see I can't really be that much of a scope snob. You put me behind a Night Force attacker, and I'm like, wow, that's a really nice scope with great glass. But the light comes in through the front. It bounces around in here and gets flipped and does all that stuff. It comes out the back here. What's the last thing the light hits before it hits my eye? My $200 set of glasses that are all scratched to hell. And I've, they're not even, look, I've got like a rubber piece on this side and not on the other side. It goes through this before it hits my eye. So can I even perceive the difference between an attacker and a vortex? Not really. Not with these eyeballs. Not with the stuff that I'm doing. But someone can, and it's worth extra money to them. So I had that same experience hunting, where a scope that I thought, in fact, in this case, it was this whole scout scope concept. Oh, right? gosh. And on the range, it was fine. It worked. And then I discovered, actually hunting, the percentage of times when the sun is very low and it's either coming pretty close to in this way or pretty close to in this way. Yeah. And now there's it's a thing. problems with the whole scout scope concept. But that never happened. You know, I didn't go zero the rifle at 6.30 in the morning. Right. So if I'm going to take this to a two-gun match that's going to be in the day in Arizona. Yeah, do a desert brutality with it or something, right? I could probably put Vaseline on the front of the lens and still do fairly okay. well. I'll get yeah. plenty of light through it. Yeah. But that's different than a hunting application. So right. So there, there are differences. Are you willing to pay for them? You know, another difference is reticle illumination. So this is a second focal plane. Uh, LPVO. So second focal plane is the one where um, no matter how I zoom in or out, relative to the field of view inside my scope, the reticle is always the same size. So that means that my bullet drop that goes out to 600 yards on this is only going to be valid at 10 power, right? If I have it set at 6 and I try to take a 400 yard shot with my reticle, I'm gonna, it's a miss every time, right? right? So then there's first focal plane reticles. We're going to have one of those. I worked on it for two months. <laughs> I was obsessed with it. And we'll have a one to eight in second focal plane like this and a one to eight in first focal plane. And the problem with the first focal plane LPVOs is that when you go to one power, the middle of that reticle disappears. Oh, it, right? It's just gone. It drops down to just a big dot. And, ah, right? So then what you do is you crank your illumination all the way up to 11 and you use it like a red dot, right? If you have the Night Force Attacker, the, the Razor Gen 3, the primary arms that I mentioned doesn't have that diffractive reticle illumination. That's why they're at a $1,600 price point. Those reticles by themselves are stupid expensive. Okay. They are incredibly expensive to get that diffractive illumination, that nuclear bright illumination, and I don't have that. So I have to crutch it in some other way. Um, I have to design my reticle very carefully so it can be seen at one power without the sort of benefit of uh, the $2,500 price level amazing nuclear bright illumination. Do you need the nuclear bright illumination because you've got a first focal plane scope and it's your go-to, um, you know, do or die? Then, yeah, it's a really good idea to have yeah, that, right? Not, not totally frivolous. Right, it's not frivolous, but I've had good used 4x4 trucks that cost me less than a Night Force attacker, right? Yeah. There's, there's, there's an a, a, a opportunity cost to all of this, right? you know? And bluntly, uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, does have an attacker and on a very nice LWRC gun, and he saved up money for like five years to build his ultimate AR. And then he took it out, and he's with match grade ammo, he's hitting like four MOA. And he's like, what's wrong with it? Is it my mount? You know, I'm like, no, nope, you got a $250 mount on there. It's not your mount. Well, it's not, is it my ammo? It's, no, it's not your ammo. It's that you saved up money for five years and got no repetitions on rifle, and you don't know how to shoot. You could have bought a $400 LPVO and built a skill set and gone and shot matches, and you'd have four years of experience on how to pull a trigger, and you'd be, that'd be a sub away rifle in the right hands, but now you're not the right hands because you spent five years not shooting and saving up money so you could be better. And then he kind of went, oh, crap. Yeah, so what you need to do is start going to matches and get your butt kicked by guys with $400 LPVOs for a couple of years, and then you'll be worthy of the money that you spent. I've had some places where people <laughs> ask me for a recommendation, and I will recommend just the totally standard basic, like, I'm looking for a good pistol. Like, you know what? Get a Glock. Find a used Glock. And it's not worth buying something better until you can articulate specifically what the better thing will do that you need it to do. Yes. And I can very much see that being appropriate. 
for right. our PBOs. If you're buying it because your favorite YouTube guy said this is the one the Navy SEALs use, it's your money. But I know I, but I'm not <laughs> his money. <laughs> yeah. From being in that position, I, it probably was not his money that paid for it. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, if you don't if you don't know why this is worth more money, then do more research. Talk to people that shoot. You know. All right. So I box is a tricky thing. The higher in magnification you get, the tighter that eye box gets. That's right. I There's no way around physics. it. That is physics. Like, I could get a $200 scope off AliExpress, and it's going to have the same eye box if the tube and the magnification are the same physical size. It's really close. There's a few little tricks that you can pull with your optical design to try to maximize it. But basically, you know, the basic formula, which I think is... Uh, you know, optic, uh, ocular lens diameter divided by magnification, that basic formula is math. You can't, you can't defeat math. And you can go look at the different websites, look at the different manufacturers, and look at their spec sheets. Go on Optics Planet and look at, they've got specs for all their scopes. What is the exit pupil? There's a shaft of light that comes out the back of this optic. What's the diameter of that shaft of light? I have to line up my eyeball with that shaft of light to look through it. All of these 1 to 10s are 2.3, 2.5, 2.6 millimeters. I'm lining up a 2.6 millimeter shaft of light with a 4 millimeter pupil in my eye. Yeah, that's going to be kind of slow and picky, you yeah. know, at that magnification, right? And that's why you see on precision rifles where they've got like a 5 to 25 on there. Now we've got a 25 magnification optic. That's why precision rifles always have those cool adjustable stocks where the, there's a cheek and you can you can tilt it just right and you can extend it and it's got little wheels everywhere that's so you can put your face in the same time on the rifle every time it's on the stock the exact same way so your eye lines up with that tiny little exit pupil the same way every time and that's why precision rifles have those crazy expensive adjustable socks okay. the bigger your magnification gets the worse it is to look through the scope and there's no there's no escaping that. You cannot negotiate with math. Math will win. Now, what about weight? Because there's definitely, get, I'm sure there's some way you can save money on weight. For you. Um, <laughs> so. Save weight with money. Save weight with money. Uh, yes and no. Again, so you ever taken all the guts out of a Glock frame and you're just holding the plastic frame and you're like, oh, this is nothing. Yeah. It's like, it's like paper in your hands. It's so thin, that thin polymer. A scope body without the glass is like that. Okay. If you have this aluminum body and I don't have any of the guts in it, it's astonishingly light. It's amazingly light. I filled it up with big, thick, heavy chunks of glass. In the future, someday, I predict, we'll have fully multi-coated glass front, fully multi-coated glass rear, and the inside will be polymer lenses. Hmm. One day. Because okay. it doesn't matter if they get, they can't get scratched up in here. Right, not if they're... The, the abrasion doesn't yeah. matter because they're internal, right? That will save us weight one day, but okay. they can't do it yet because you lose too much light transmission, you get distortions, you get chromatic aberration, all the stuff that you don't want. So they're working on it, but we're not there yet. That will save weight across the board. Right now, all these LPVOs, 1 to 6, 1 to 8, 1 to 10... They're all pretty much the same size and weight, with one exception. And I have to give props to a former employer of mine, Primary Arms. Um, Primary Arms has a 1 to 8 platinum, Jap Japanese made optic, and they had a long gestation period with that optic. And they basically challenged their Japanese manufacturer and said, We want to do LPVO stuff. Can we make it smaller and lighter? And they, they, for years, they've been working on this. And that optic just won a, its first contract with the Department of Energy. So the DOE, wow. okay. so the DOE is rocking primary arms now, and it is significantly smaller and lighter. And as far as I'm concerned, it's witchcraft. Huh. I have okay. no idea how they managed to accomplish that, but that what they did was somehow somebody had a breakthrough in optical design, optical engineering. One of the real engineers that has a degree in the math figured out a way to cut out a lens or to make a lens thinner or to make a laminate lens where you have, it's one lens, but it's really three shapes inside it. So it does the light bending of multiple lenses. I don't know how. Um, I should like buy one and take a Sawzall to it and cut it in half and see, right? But, but that shows that it's possible. 
right? So primary arms is the first one. They got this one date that's super light and, 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 and it's shorter and everything. And apparently they didn't give up anything. It doesn't have bad optical qualities. It doesn't have a narrow depth of field. It's a home run. Um, watch that proliferate. Okay. Another year from now, another two years from now, someone is going to buy a couple of them, take a Sawzall, figure it out, say, hey, we can do that. They'll reverse engineer it. They'll do their version. Someone else will come up with the same mathematical solution on their own, perhaps, that happens, you know, and you'll see loophole or someone else is going to come out with, hey, we can do this smaller and lighter now. Now, one way you could save weight would be to remove the illumination. A little, but it doesn't matter that much. A little, little circuit battery, board. I guess a little tiny battery, not a big deal. Yeah, a, a, a CR2032 battery is less than an ounce. We got a little circuit board in here. We got a little bit of wiring. The uh, the emitter itself is is tiny. Really, you don't save that much weight with e with an emitter. Okay. What you save is complexity, cost, and a failure point. Okay. I can't. You know, if, if this has got decent illumination and it, it's an illuminated etched reticle, it's proven technology. Um, but it's possible that, you know, on some of these down the road, the illumination conks out. Guys have to call Bob at customer service. Hey, my illumination won't work. And then it's an RMA and they get another optic from us, right? How do we prevent that? Well, we could do one that's not illuminated at all. And there's less to go wrong, okay. right? So there's, a, there's cost and complexity and those things. But I don't think weight is really that much of a factor when it comes to the illumination stuff. It really is the glass that's... It's the glass is so heavy. Um, yeah, it's such a high percentage of the optics weight. So what about repeatability of your adjustments? Right. Is that, how much of that is involved in price point? Uh, much. The low end ones really just as good? No, they are not. Uh, and, and, and we had to talk in a previous video about quality control. Yeah. That's very true with, with turrets. So these turrets are exposed locking turrets. I can't turn it, I can't turn it, I have to pull it up, and I can then have tactile and audible clicks. Once I've made my adjustment, I can either set it back to zero if I want to, or I can just push it down and lock it. Either way, whatever my preference is. There's a spline on here that, where my outer turret hits my inner turret, and the number of teeth on the spline is much less than the number of adjustments that I have on, on this, the, that's etched on the outside of this turret, right? So if I play with this enough and I have enough permutations of taking it on, putting it off, taking it on, putting it off, and spinning this around, I can get to where I have my indicator on the scope body in between two hash marks on this optic, right? It's in between two, so it's between the number 44 and the number 44.1 in a one-tenth you know, mil adjustment or half MOA, whichever, whatever it is. In a $2,500 optic, unacceptable, right? Again, does that mean that they have, that their five axis CNC machines are better than our five axis CNC machines? Maybe, but I have this theory, once you really understand this, it's almost terrifying. When you think about the world economy and globally sourced parts and our standard of living and, and what, what we're making, what we're paying each other, if I have a five axis CNC machine and it's at the Colt factory in Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm a, I'm a unionized worker making $35 an hour, and at $35 an hour, I hit the start button, it makes a turret, you know, right? It makes a part that I programmed to that CNC. I take that CNC machine and I move it to Kuala Lumpur or I move it to French Guiana or I move it to Vietnam, someplace that's, that's you know, was communist and is discovering capitalism. I plug it into a wall there in Vietnam and the guy who makes $4 a day and feeds his whole family on that, by the way, hits the start button. It doesn't say, well, I'm in Vietnam now, I'm gonna make crappy parts. The CNC machine does not care. Right. It makes the same part wherever you plug it into anywhere in the world. Let that sink in because it's a little scary. Okay, that's yeah. reality. Yeah. So. I don't know that Vortex can make turrets that are perfect every time for their generation three, one to 10. I do know that their turrets are better than ours because they're discarding all of the imperfect ones. They all go into a pile of aluminum and a pile of stainless steel and a pile of, of, of brass or copper or whatever. And then they melt that stuff down and they try again, right? It's the, it's the discard pile. Yep. And you pay for all the discards when you pay for the scope. Right. You're not just paying for this one, you're paying for all the parts that they threw away, getting you a more high quality result. So I don't know how much of that is that 
their tooling and their machinery is better and how much of that is that their QC is better. But either way, if you want perfect turrets, you will pay through the nose for perfect turrets. So that really is an area where money translates pretty efficiently into better performance. It does. If you actually need that performance. Right. Because if, if I'm at, if this is half MOA per click and I'm in between two clicks, then at 300 yards, I have a 1.5 inch shift, depending on if I'm at number 44 or at the hash wire next to it, I'm 1.5 inches off at 300 yards. Do I care? Can I, you tell? I, I don't, <laughs> right. Like, is, was that the thing that made me go there instead of there? Or was it wind? Was it ammo? Was it my finger on the trigger? Was it that my eye wasn't quite behind? You know, there's like all these other factors. And if you're shooting PRS and you're shooting these, you know, precision cost money, what those guys are spending tons of money to do is to eliminate as many factors as possible so then they can say, aha, I missed my wind call. Right. Not, oh, it could have been my mound, it could have been my parallax setting, it could have been this, it could have been that. They want to spend money to get rid of all those variables so then they know which variables to focus on, you know, for their, for their application. If that's you, then it's worth the money to you to do that. I'm happy as a clam to take a 5.56 gun and ring steel at 600 yards before that caliber is totally out of gas. If I can get this gun to 600 yards on steel for $400, yes, please sign me up. Yeah, I'll take it. And think about all the history that you've looked at. The amazing thing is how much progress there's been made and how much higher our expectations are. Massive. Look at, look at the history of what you've, you've done on the channel. If I told someone, if I told your channel 10 years ago that I'd have a parts built AR that I, you know, got a piece from here and a piece from there on Black Friday sale and I Cerakoted it and I have a $400 Chinese made scope and I'm going to shoot bulk pack 55 grain, you know, PMC or whatever, and I'm going to hit it 600 yards every time. You would laugh in my face. Uh, <laughs> generally speaking, the accuracy standard for World War II rifles was about four MOA. Right. Maybe five or six in some cases. And the sniper rifles weren't much better than that. Right. So. I had a friend who overspent a lot of money on one of the original PU sniper, the, the, the Mosin the Gantz with the real PU on it. It's all numbers match and everything. Yeah. He spent a lot of money for it. I said, hey, how's it shooting? He said, the, the scope's to help you see how much you missed by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoops. <laughs> Which makes you wonder about the SVTs. So those things replaced because the SVTs weren't accurate. Right. Well, and even us on our side, we had the M1 Grand Snipers, and they weren't around for very long because they, they, you know, it had a scope on it, but the real-world performance just was nothing like what's available to a civilian for, you know, you could put one of these together now for, uh, you know, $1,200 yeah. in an AR like this, and, and, man, you are golden compared to most military weapons throughout the 20th century. You're golden. So we're even in an amazing age right now. Even a lot of military weapons currently in service today. Yeah. When you get outside of like first tier, first world major militaries and you look at what second and third world countries have as actual military issue. It's rough. Th this, yeah. this, the AI generated stereotypical <laughs> shot show yeah. AR. Yeah. This is a great AR. It really is. But I asked, I asked an AI bot to make me a, uh, a, an image of an AR-15 at SHOT Show, and it came up with this. <laughs> so. <laughs> but even this would blow away a lot of the stuff that's being used in places around the world. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I remember uh, remember the attack in Beslan in, yeah. in Russia, right? The terrorists, they blew up the school and killed all these kids, and they, 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 they sort of they escaped, and they ran through the hinterland. I had like a, 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 I felt so guilty. I felt personally guilty because I wa I'm obsessed by the footage of this and I'm getting updates and I'm watching it. And these guys are like chasing these guys with like iron sided SKS rifles, terrorists that kill children. And they're, they've got a 10 shot iron sided SKS. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I got better stuff in my closet. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> you know, like I felt guilty. Like, like I felt so bad. You know, they, these guys have, they have nothing, but that's, that's kind of why I do what I do, you know, to get on my soapbox for a second. I want the blue collar, ordinary dude who's got two kids, hi Faisal, hi Kayla, who are, are trying to figure out how they're going to pay for their college. And, you know, like they, they got a job that's not that great and they don't like their boss that much. I'm lucky. I like my boss. They're working for the weekend and they just want to ring some steel and they want to compete, right? 
they deserve, they deserve to have something at a, at a high level. The Second Amendment applies to that guy. Absolutely. He has a right to defend his family, he has a right to defend his life, he has a right to have fun with guns. Let's make it fun. And, and if I can help those guys buy into the Second Amendment, I will. The Second Amendment is for you. You can afford this. Go do the thing. It's, it's, you can do amazing things with a rifle like this with some practice and some ammo. Go do it. Because the whole stop being poor thing, nothing makes me more mad than that. You know, this sort of, well, if you can't afford a $10,000 rifle, then just keep a baseball bat under your bed and throw some ninja stars at him, you loser. No, no. the Second Amendment applies to all of us. Yeah. And that's why I love this startup mode, this, this budget area where I'm at. This is my lane, man. Uh, and I believe in that down to my bottom of my feet, you know. I think so. that's pretty clear to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. So, anyway. That's cool. LPVOs. They're not dead. That's why they were getting hate clicks on, on YouTube. LPVOs are dead. They're over. No, they're not. No, they're totally no, not. They're no, totally they're not. Just, no. We could go into when do you want LPVO and when do you want a prism versus when do you want a red. Oh, hunt. yeah. That's a, that's a whole separate. That's That's a whole series of YouTube videos, yeah, but I that, love it. That everybody else has also already done. I'm still a red dot plus magnifier guy. I, I love red dots and magnifiers. So, yeah. So All, of above, okay. All of the above, man. All of the above. Yeah. All right. We'll get into that later. Uh, if you are looking for an inexpensive but very capable LPVO, Gideon Optics. GideonOptics.com. You also do pistol dots. And I got a little dots. prism scope. Yeah. Prism scopes. We're expanding out. There you got go. a good pistol dots. Anyway, right. Ian, I appreciate it so much. This has been a lot of fun. My pleasure. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.